Good afternoon. Thank you for taking time to join our CPG Pandemic Resilient Playbook webinar. My name is Vanessa from CPG Consultants, and I will be your MC for today. We are really glad to have you with us this afternoon. I hope everyone is settling in well. Currently, we are having people progressively logging into the webinar. So for those who are already here, you may wish to take this time to grab your coffee or tea and make yourselves comfortable. Sit back and relax and be ready to join us as we embark on the pandemic resilience journey. Throughout the presentations, you can use the Q&A tab at the screen below to post questions which you may have for us. If you see a question similar to yours that has been asked, you may also upload the question. We shall address your questions during the panel discussion later and try to cover as many questions as possible within the given time. COVID-19 has challenged the status quo and transformed people's perception of places and spaces where we work and play. It is crucial for us to take the lessons learned from the pandemic and apply it to improving the future. In this webinar, we will cover excerpts from the CPG Pandemic Resilient Playbook, a document where we set out design strategies for the built environment based on our technical expertise, past project experiences, and international best practices. All right, it seems that most of our audiences are already here. For the benefit of those who have just logged in, please note again that throughout the presentations, you can use the Q&A tab to post questions which you may have for us. If you see a question similar to yours that has been asked, you may also upvote the question. We shall address your questions during the panel discussion later and try to cover as many questions as possible within the given time. Now, to start off the webinar, CPG President and Group CEO Architect Kyu Sin Kun will give a short opening address. Thereafter, architect Jerry Ong will provide an introduction to our playbook design framework underlined by six key design strategies. Our subsequent four presentations will focus on the design strategies, materiality, and designing building services for pandemic resilience, with case studies from two typologies, education and healthcare. Lastly, we will have a panel model uh, discussion moderated by our Group Chief Innovation Officer, architect Tan Xiaoyan, with more in-depth discussions on pandemic resilience in the built environment. Without further ado, allow me to welcome CPG President Group and Group CEO, architect Q Sing Kun. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Good afternoon and welcome to CPG's Pandemic Resilience Playbook webinar. To our <clears throat> partners, very warm welcome. To our staff in CPG who are calling in from overseas, I hope you are safe. And those who are in Singapore, I think the last week has been very promising with uh, zero community infections. Under no normal circumstances, I would probably be speaking you, to all of you from a lectern on a stage in a physical conference hall. But that's how COVID-19 has forced us to change our lives and expectations. This pandemic is the mother of all disruptors and has affected every country globally, turned our lives topsy-turvy for the larger, larger part of 2020. It has highlighted the challenges faced by our built environment sector, and in particular, how we design and use our buildings. It emphasizes the need for flexibility and transformability of our designs to cater to such unprecedented pandemics in future, and they will come. Before and after the circuit breaker, I followed the news every night, or well, there was nothing else much to do, with great interest and anxiety as a number of COVID infections rose day by day. Each night, we see the building, the National Center for Infectious Diseases being featured on the news. The NCID is a customized infectious diseases hospital and is the gold standard in isolation and infection control. 
It was with good foresight and planning by the government and the determination and hard work by the consultants and contractors and a little bit of luck that we managed to finish the NCID a few months earlier and was operationally ready before the full impact of COVID-19 struck Singapore. Imagine if COVID-19 had hit when the NCID was still under construction and conversions ad hoc or otherwise had to be made to the existing hospital infrastructure and having to mix the increasing numbers of COVID positive patients with the existing hospital patients. The outcome may have been very different today. I'm proud of the CPG team that delivered the NCID and as it turned out, <clears throat> the building served its purpose excellently. But what are the lessons that we have learned from the past eight or nine months? How do we make our designs more resilient in the face of future pandemics? How do our future design strategies create a built environment that is more efficient in mitigating transmission within our spaces, whether indoors or outdoors? To achieve pandemic resilience, there's a need to develop a set of guidelines for different building types and clearly define the objectives in planning for another similar outbreak in future. We are focused on the key objectives of sustainability resilience and safety. Applying the lessons from our healthcare projects in CPG, we came up with six design strategies, which we believe can act as guiding principles to strengthening pandemic resilience in our built environment. These strategies will be shared by our speakers in their respective presentations in the next hour and a half. And even as we wait with optimism and anticipation of a viable vaccine, and a possible return to our normal pre-COVID existence. We should not forget the lessons learned in 2020 and prepare ourselves for the next crisis. After all, the world has seen SARS, MERS, um, H1N1, and now COVID-19. I'm sure there will be more to come. At CPG, we hope to document some of our lessons and insights as a way of enhancing our in-house preparedness and to do our part in designing a pandemic resilient built environment. The CPG Pandemic Resilient Playbook is the outcome of the expertise and experience of our architects and engineers to put together pandemic resilient strategies for our future designs from offices to schools, to hospitals and airports. Whilst the Pandemic Resilient Playbook is certainly not meant to be a prescriptive code, it serves as a quick guide to our built environment professionals to gain an overview and to have a systematic approach in how to incorporate appropriate pandemic resilient features in our respective project typologies. Today's webinar is a sharing of ideas and to start the conversations with like-minded partners in a way we want to see our built environment industry progress. Join us to co-create solutions for a safer, sustainable and resilient future for Singapore. Once again, thank you for joining us and I wish you a fruitful seminar. Thank you, Mr. Q. Next, architect Jerry Ong will share an introduction of the CPG Pandemic Resilience Playbook. Jerry is Senior Vice President of the Healthcare Division under CPG Consultants. He has led key projects such as Kutik Puat Hospital and the National Center for Infectious Diseases. On to you, Jerry. Thank you, Vanessa. Good afternoon, everybody. It's been a year since news of COVID-19 first broke in China and more than seven months since Circuit Breaker was implemented in Singapore. I think it will not be an understatement to say that our basic outlook on life and our comfort level in public spaces will never be the same as it was before COVID-19. The post-COVID-19 world will definitely be very different from the one we remembered. We know we should take the lessons learned from the pandemic and apply it to improving for the future. Yet it's crucial that we do not allow all these lessons learned to be undone. 
only to pick them up again when the next pandemic strikes. As we look forward to phase three, we at CPG have put together a playbook to document some of our insights and lessons learned from the pandemic. The process actually started last year after the official opening of National Center for Infectious Diseases or NCID. The project team started to compile the learning points and good practices of the project with the view that it will be useful for future healthcare projects. But as the pandemic spreads and drags on, there's an increasing interest in resilience design for other typologies. And that motivated the team to galvanize subject matter experts within CPG to work on a document that will be applicable for all typologies. And the CPG Pandemic Resilience Playbook was conceptualized. The playbook is a live working document where we illustrate design strategies for the built environment based on our technical expertise, past project experiences, and international best practices. The playbook establishes a framework that was developed as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic to be used as a reference for different building typologies. However, we are also very mindful that the approach and response we have to take has to be more holistic, as the next pandemic may be very different from COVID-19. The playbook is not meant to be a prescriptive code. Instead, it's meant to serve as a quick guide for anyone reading it to gain an overview as well as an understanding of how to incorporate pandemic resilient features in projects. To shape a pandemic resilient built environment, we identified three broad objectives, which would strengthen environmental sustainability and prepare the community to better combat the challenges posed by future unknown pandemics. So first, safety. Well, I think we all can understand very clearly, safety is the single most important aspect in our consideration. So first and foremost, we must protect building occupants and minimize the spread of the contagion. Resilience. We, have to you know, we really seek to provide resilience through design to ensure operational continuity and enable normality for the building occupants. Sustainability. Uh, well, any measure or solutions must be sustainable in the long run. We cannot afford to invest heavily in infrastructure that may become white elephants. So these solutions must be flexible and adaptable in various scenarios for various functions. So strategically designing buildings to be sustainable, resilient and safe is key to a pandemic resilient built environment. To achieve this, we propose a design framework at the core of the framework are the four stages of an emergency, which of course in this case is COVID-19 pandemic. These four stages of an emergency are, first, prevention and mitigation. The focus here is really on reducing risk because as the saying goes, you know, prevention is better than cure. So we have to design it right, correctly from the start. You know, to build in flexibility and adaptability as the main trust of the planning principles to cater for various scenarios. Number two, coordinated approach to preparedness. The focus here is really on extending mitigation towards operational preparedness. We have to make provision for the event, however unlikely it may appear now. For example, you know, how we choose certain materials, how we design our systems. Integrated response. So when the event, whether it's a, whether it's a pandemic, does happen, the purpose is to allow for appropriate response to deal with the changing situations and priorities. Continuity of business and operations. Well, the goal here, obviously, is to continue operations for the mid to long term, with human wellness in mind and ultimately for recovery. So we, a set of six design strategies are then proposed to be used in each of these four stages. Prioritize, and adapted accordingly to the situation and program. These six strategies can also be read individually or in combination with one another, depend, depending on the specific requirements of the situation and project. So let me give you an overview of these six strategies now. Planning principle. Well, resiliency is like elasticity. The principles of planning never change. We only learn and adapt from our experiences so we can be better prepared for the next event. This list of planning parameters in the playbook is not meant to be comprehensive. 
but really it's a starting point for considerations towards pandemic resiliency planning, with flexibility and adaptability as the main driver, so that we can be as ready as possible for the next pandemic. We have considered these design strategies for both urban and building scale developments, as they are interrelated in the consideration for the effective hierarchy of controls. Materiality. To achieve pandemic resilience, it will be important to understand the need to choose materials wisely, not just for their aesthetic value, but also to minimize transmission through material contact. How we select materials and surfaces with antimicrobial properties that inhibits pathogen growth and understanding the type of surfaces that is easy to clean and disinfect. Modern buildings now run on complex mechanical, electrical, and other specialized systems. These systems are essential to maintain the desired temperature, humidity, lighting, and air quality in the building. From a pandemic standpoint, these systems, especially the air conditioning and mechanical ventilation design, play a very important role in designing pandemic resilient environments. Well, I'm sure you all agree that life without technology nowadays is really unimaginable, you know, into this very dynamic world. Technology brings together tools to promote development and information exchange. It makes our tasks easier, solve many of our problems on a daily basis. Technology, however, cannot prevent the onset of pandemics. It can help to prevent the spread, educate, warn, and also empower those on the ground to be aware of the situation and lessen the impact. Nature and wellness. Being healthy does not refer to only physical health, but also includes mental wellness, as COVID-19 has taught us well. Nature offers a conducive environment which boosts society's well-being and productivity. This strategy seeks to incorporate biophilia in planning and design to achieve that goal. Smart estates. Now, this strategy is about smart facility management in the context of a pandemic. It's about leveraging on data analytics, predictive maintenance, and smart technology solutions to raise productivity and efficiency. This will help reduce labor intensity and enhance service delivery and quality. So I hope that the design framework and its strategies will be useful to you in shaping a pandemic resilient environment. We will now hear from the next few speakers. We have chosen two out of six strategies for today's webinar. Patrick Lang and Orville will be giving you an overview of the strategies of system design and materiality. Patrick Tan and Saurabh will then speak on the in-depth application of these six strategies in the typologies of education and healthcare. So thank you very much. Back to you, Vanessa. Thank you, Jerry, for sharing the overview and sharing the playbook framework. Now, to start off with the sharing of one of the design strategies, Orville Innumerable, who is also from the healthcare division, will be sharing his presentation on materiality. Orville is Senior Principal Architectural Associate, who was part of the team that designed and implemented the National Centre for Infectious Diseases and Centre for Healthcare Innovation Projects. He is currently actively involved in the development of a hospital in Yangon. Today, Orville will be, taking, or will be talking about how material selections and maintenance can impact the transmission of pathogens. Orville, on to you now. Thank you, Vanessa. Hello and a blessed day, afternoon to everyone. Let's talk about touch and surfaces. Have you ever wondered how many surfaces you touch each day? Right now, are you touching your face? Are you doing this? So each and every day, we touch a lot of things. From the time we wake up, you touch your alarm clock or your phone. From a simple task as riding the MIT, you get your easily, tap, hold onto the escalator, grab rail, and use your phone, and so on. Just an example. When I went for my grocery, even if I tried to touch a few things as possible, I counted 20 touches. 
So why knowing this is important? It builds awareness. You see, research have found that COVID-19 remains viable up to four days on glass. Up to three days on stainless steel and plastic, up to two days on clothes, up to one day on a cardboard or a paper, and this is amazing, up to four hour on copper. How about the next virus? No one knows. That's beyond our control. But what we can control right now is our action and gaining the knowledge on surface and materials. So what do we touch every day? We touch the doorknobs, phones, elevator buttons, electrical switches, furnitures, everything around us. We call this the high touch surfaces. Furthermore, high touch surfaces can be categorized into two sections. One is a hard surface and the other is a soft surface. So everyone agrees when we think about high touch surfaces, it is often considered in the context of a hospital, a patient room. But everyone knows that high touch items are also found in public and private spaces like malls, airports, schools, residence, etc. So microbes can be lingering there if not properly cleaned and disinfected. It can be transmitted from person to person without us knowing it. Imagine this scenario. Say John visits his friend in the hospital and Jan and John sat on a, on a patient bed or on a chair. As I mentioned earlier, microbes can stay hours or even days on surfaces if it's not clean. Now John could be a potential carrier now of a virus or a bacteria. So before leaving the hospital, John uh, wash his hands or maybe use the hand sanitizer and he went to um, a coffee shop. Okay, even though he washed his hands, the virus might still be in his clothes. So let's continue. He stopped, get his uh, coffee, sat on a chair, and then a few minutes he left. Now here you come along. Sat on the same chair where John sat. You are also now a potential carrier of a virus or a bacteria that you might bring back home. So does it make sense to you? Surfaces and materials are all around us. So what can we do now as an architect? As an architect and designer, what we can do as part of the solution, we can minimize transmission through material contact. As I said earlier, we interact with materials and surfaces each and every day and per to perform our daily lives. We can control people from touching surfaces, but we can minimize bacteria and viruses from spreading. So we need to determine the materials and surfaces that are suitable to stop the virus or bacteria growth. And there's also a need to understand the properties and if they are easy to clean and maintain and disinfect. So what do we have for you today? We will give you five quick questions or guides that you can use to discuss with your clients, your users, and colleagues. Number one, is it appropriate for the space or the usage? So selecting material or for a specific area is really important for the space to function properly, right? So everyone agrees when we think of materials, we go with aesthetic first. How beautiful it is, how it blends with our overall design. Now, the new norm will be choosing finishes for floor, wall, ceiling, furniture that can help us stop and spread the virus. Example, in this uh, CPG project, the Hive at NTU, the use of aluminum coated frames is very good. It gives minimal maintenance and it is easy to clean. And this one, they've used also concrete floor with sealer. The use of concrete floor in this example, in this scenario, is a good choice because it is a hallway, it's a corridor, and it's always busy. With cleaning, I mean, with the students going in and out of their uh, classrooms, 
Now, cleaning of spills, it's very easy to, disin to disinfect the flooring. Imagine if carpets were specified, I'm sure the maintenance will be a nightmare. The carpets can absorb the viruses and multiply. And eventually the campus needs to be closed for disinfection and we do not want that. Next, another example here is the Indengpong Center for Healthcare Innovation, or we call CHI. CPG choose fabric or furniture that can easily be wiped down in the event of accidental spill or droplets. The use of laminates uh, for countertops instead of natural stones also minimize the viruses and the bacteria from growing. Therefore, again, minimizing transmission through contact. Now here in this example, Carpet was chosen due to the acoustic properties or the requirements of this, this space. Now, what, what we need to do in place is an SOP. An SOP has to be implemented when to clean and how to disinfect these carpets. Okay, so if you will need to do um, to specify a carpet, you can take a look at antimicrobial properties, our next guide. So does it have antimicrobial properties? You see materials that destroys the growth of microbes are considered antimicrobial properties. And these antimicrobial technologies can be applied in different surfaces of the built environment. Say for example, uh, ceiling or walls. Ceiling grids, ceiling tiles are now manufactured with antimicrobial properties. And how about paints? Paints are also being uh, developed now with antimicrobial properties as well. You can hear about silver ions on the paints. How about carpentry works and countertops? High pressure laminates, and you can also use counters with semi-pressure stones. How about flooring? Now flooring, there's a lot of choices now. You can go for cork flooring, bamboo flooring, and even ceramic and porcelain tiles have this technology uh, they call now the microband technology or something similar. You can choose also linoleum and uh, vinyl flooring. And how about carpets? As I said earlier, there is a microband technology now that's being developed. And hardware and ironmongery. Hardware and ironmongery now, they are being explored to use copper or some of them have this silver nanoparticles. Amazing. So in this hospital environment, such as the Intengpong General Hospital, antimicrobial properties are a must, especially in patient rooms where hygiene is really critical. So you can see here uh, fabrics, use of antimicrobial properties, the ceiling grids, okay, and also the flooring, the vinyl, the vinyl sheets for seamless flooring. Okay, in Camran International Airport in Vietnam, Door handles, countertops, and elevator buttons are a high touch surfaces that can use antimicrobial technologies as well. The seats, chairs are also considered high touch surfaces in an airport environment. So the use of fabrics with antimicrobial technology will minimize transmission as well. Now, number three, is it easy to clean and disinfect? Even if we specify materials that have antimicrobial properties is no use if you cannot clean it. Some of the key features that determine the cleanability of the surfaces are smooth flat surfaces without recess that do not allow microbes to grow. And you can also avoid hard to reach detailing in fitments and furnitures and design and avoid complicated designs in high touch surfaces like doorknobs, handles, and etc. And this is very good also, the use of coved up uh, floor and wall and joints, okay? non porous also is very good as well. Okay, so in this environment, smooth flat surfaces was used and the coved up floor wall joints as well. Okay, now in the National Art Gallery ticketing and admission where the large crowds could gather, the use of smooth flat surfaces was very good as well. You can see here, uh, and also they avoid hard to use, uh, hard to reach detailing as well. Number four, is it non-porous or porous? A non-porous materials 
can prevent fluid or air to be absorbed. What are those? Glass, metal, plastic, treated wood, vinyl sheets, synthetic stones. How about for porous materials? Any materials that have pores or holes or voids that can absorb water. What are those materials? Paper, fabric, carpets, cardboard, untreated wood. So here in the Kamran uh, International Airport, you can see here ceiling reeds are made of metal, the use of synthetic uh, fabrics as well. Okay, in the Yonya Junior College here in Singapore, you can see there's a lot of non-porous materials that you can find. Okay, I'll just mention a few, the use of laminates on tables and also the concrete flooring with sealer. And number five, is it environmentally friendly? You see, we are all concerned about our health and minimizing the spread of the virus. Let's not forget about the environment. As part of our responsibility, it is really to specify materials that are environmentally friendly, health conscious, and materials that are sourced from sustainable methods. You see, there's here in Singapore, there's a lot of green certification that you can take a look at. You see, there's this green label for Singapore, Singapore green building products, and so much more. And we've used this extensively in our projects. The NCID, we've used this as well, the National Center for Infectious Disease, and also the Changi International Airport, and so much more. So as an individual, what can we do? Definitely wash our hands. What has washing got to do with materiality? Hand washing is a personal discipline, but sometimes we are so busy with our work that we forgot these minor things. So remember my story earlier that I touch about 20 surfaces or materials. So after this webinar, guys, please stretch a bit, take a trip to the nearest sink and wash your hands. Thank you very much. And I bring you back to Vanessa. Thank you, Avil, for the hand washing reminder. The scenario example you shared certainly showed that materiality is an important consideration now that people are more mindful of infections. And as we know, designing building services is an integral part of building projects. Next, we have engineer Patrick Lam to share more on these systems. Patrick Lam is senior consultant from the Mechanical and Electrical Engineering Division and a CPG consultant. He has a rich experience with building services for many offices, airport, and hospital projects. Patrick's most recent project is the National Center for Infectious Diseases. He will be sharing some of the challenges faced by building services in the pandemic context, as well as recommended solutions. Patrick, please. Thank you. This afternoon, I would like to share with you our experience in the designing of building services for epidemic resilience. Now, this is a photo of the single pass AHUs air handling units in NCID. We will be also touching on other buildings this afternoon, uh, such as shopping malls, offices, schools, etc. Building services support the safety of the indoor air environment for occupants as epidemic transmission can be airborne, waterborne, or through contacts. The indoor environment is critical and very important for epidemic control. We will be touching on ventilation, plumbing sanitary, electrical, and at the end, we will also be touching on existing buildings. Common transmission paths. The infected person may emit droplets. The droplets can settle down. We are told about one, two meters away. They rest on surfaces, for example, this table, and can be transmitted to touch. Now, some of the particles, some of the droplets may eventually become smaller droplets. And the smaller droplets would move much further. It stay in the air much longer. So airborne droplets are 
also another source of transmission. We are more concerned on those smaller than five micron because they are respirable and can go into our lungs. BCA has in May this year issued a guidance note on ACMV operation amid COVID-19 situations. There are two main recommendations. One is increased ventilation for indoor air dilution. There are a number of strategies we will touch on in the following slides to increase outdoor air intake, provide more outdoor intake into the space to dilute, remove the contaminants and the concentration of virus inside the building. Now, another recommendation is to enhance indoor air cleaning, to clean the air inside the building to remove the virus and contaminants using filters or UVGI. Let's have a look at dilution. This table is extracted from data from the US CDC. Now, if I provide fresh air, external air into the room at two air change per hour, that means I would be supplying per hour twice the volume of air, twice the volume of the room inside into the space, uh, into the room. The dilution efficiency at 90%, 99% would take 138 minutes, meaning that it would take 138 minutes to dilute the concentration to 1% of the original. Uh, this is recommended, two air changes recommended for normal buildings. Now for uh, isolation rooms, we typically use 12 air change. And for more critical, more dangerous viruses, 20 air change. Now with the increase in the amount of air, amount of fresh air that go into the space, the air conditioning have to work harder. So in our design, we would be providing energy recovery, energy saving measures. Now, BCA also recommend to uh, certain aircon features uh, to be disabled during uh, pandemic situation. For example, uh, if the building have less occupant, normally the aircon would reduce automatically, but BCA recommend continue, continue to provide the same air change, dilute the pollutions, pollutants and reduce the risk. Uh, also air purging, also the toilet ventilation, do not switch it off so fast after the office hours. Continue to exhaust and flush away the foul air. This is an example of one of our projects. This one is in Maldives, a hospital project. Now, this is the space, for example, the office and et cetera. Now, in the morning before the starting of the aircon, the perch fan is used to extract the air, the overnight air out of the building and replaced by fresh air. During the operation of the aircon, subsequently, more outdoor air can be provided to dilute the pollutants. An interesting uh, point is Songning. Now the air is supplied at the top, at the roof, now at the ceiling of the room. Now the supply air is exhausted and returned back to the air handling unit at low level. In this way, the air sweeps it moved through the briefing zone and the accumulation of virus pollutants would be reduced in the briefing zone. This is one of the 
project we do where we provide low level return air. Now another one is the air is supplied at the ceiling level and return at one end of the room. So some of the air may have to travel a certain distance across the room and deteriorate in quality, pick up more pollutants, viruses. And if we provide an additional return air here, the travel distance, the flow distance of the air would reduce with less risk. This is a computer simulation we did for one of our projects. In this one, we provide return air grills at the corners and also at the two sides. How about humidity? For low humidity, we are not very concerned in the local climate. Now, we are more concerned in high relative humidity because it would have encouraged mold growth and fungus growth. For Singapore, the indoor air quality practice is RH, the humidity for new buildings should be less than 65%. For existing building is 70%. So this is the norm that we would be designing to. And we also know from our experience that stagnant areas could accumulate more moisture. So we would also be paying attention to the flow and distribution of air in the space. How about natural ventilation? It is energy efficient, but it is subjected to weather. Sometimes there may be no wind, sometimes the wind can also reverse in direction. So for natural ventilation, which is useful for transit spaces, concourses, etc., we will conduct computer simulation also to check the airflow using prevalent uh, normal air directions to check the airflow in the natural ventilated area. Maybe adding jack fans, big ass fans to assist the natural ventilation, uh, HIPAA filters units at certain locations, and also even evaporative cooling units. We see quite often nowadays in places like food court, etc. Air filter. MERV 13 and 14 air filters are recommended. Uh, we are not really concerned of the issue because MERV 13 and 14 filters are common, commonly used nowadays. It can also be supplemented by using UVGI, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. There are three types, UVA, UVB, and UVC. Now, UVC is harmful, and we, uh, but it is effective. So we are using it quite often in air handling units and air dust. Now, for example, this uh, air handling unit in one of our projects using UVC light tubes. Uh, there are also some new developments coming in the next one, two years. This is the upper ceiling application where UVGI is used at the upper ceiling area above the occupied zone. Now, how about plumbing? Now for plumbing, the important part is correct pipe sizing so as to achieve efficient flushing velocity. The plumbing can also be designed in zones so that individual zones can be flushed when required. For plumbing, the proper venting is important. Now, this is an area where in NCID, where the wastewater from the isolation rooms are collected and disinfected 
this is a requirement to disinfect the wastewater before discharge into the public sewer. Electrical system, they are not directly, directly affecting the spread of virus, but nevertheless, it provides the backbone, power the air handling units, fans, etc. So emergency power supply is important. Uh, elevators and lifts, they put uh, with possible UV sanitizer, uh, contact neck sensors, etc., are provided by the electrical system. Now for existing buildings, in order to be epidemic resilient, do we need to change the building services systems? Now, for existing buildings, we have to do a survey. Maybe we can just adjust the AHU fan or add a fresh air, air, air handling units to complement the existing units, uh, adjust the aircon outlets, additional return, air return locations, uh, adding UVGI at the air handling units or inside the air ducts for uh, water supply pipes, maybe strategically uh, locate flushing ponds to provide efficient flushing, save on time and labor, etc. These are the possibilities. So with that, I end my uh, gist on the epidemic resilience design for building services. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick, for the highlights on building services, recommendations for new buildings, and considerations for existing buildings as well, which forms the majority of our current built environment. Before introducing our next speaker, if you have any questions for Patrick or the previous presenters, please feel free to post it using the Q&A tab below. Now, let's invite another Patrick, architect Patrick Tan, Vice President of the Education Division under CBG Consultants, will share more about design considerations for building pandemic resilient educational facilities. Patrick Tan has more than 20 years of experience in the design and development of education facilities. He led the design team for GEMS World Academy Singapore and recently completed development of the UOW KDU Penang University in Malaysia. Patrick is also currently working on upgrades for the School of Design and Environment 1 and 3 in the National University of Singapore. On to you now, Patrick. Thank you, Vanessa, and good, good afternoon, everyone. In April this year, all schools in Singapore shifted from regular school to home-based learning. This measure was further extended to June with the easing of circuit breaker and with many schools still implemental, implementing partial home-based learning in a careful but collaborated manner. Now you've heard from Orville and Patrick Lam on materiality and also building services. On this section on education design, I will talk through some thought process and strategies that we as architects have considered in designing the learning environment and share some of the consideration for a safe return back to school. Planning can be done for two different age groups, the younger children who are in kindergarten and elementary school and the older kids in secondary and tertiary education. The planning strategies and facilities required are slightly different. For younger children, it is better to separate them into smaller groups, keeping them within their social bubble and supervised by one or two teachers. Small groups should ideally be kept apart on arrival, departure, and throughout the day, including taking turns at recess and play. For the older children, they need less supervision and are more suited for home-based learning as they are more independent. For partial home-based learning, educational programs can be scheduled to rotate weekly between home and school to reduce any exposure. 
Flexibility and adaptability are always key in spatial design and planning. Designs need to be future ready, meaning providing spaces that can be easily convertible and can adapt to ever-changing education pedagogy, as well as allow segregation and decentralization when required. There is an advantage in providing a variety of learning spaces, big and small, to cater to different groups, students and teachers. Larger spaces have more flexibility and can accommodate many more functions. And we also need to embrace technology, enhance our IT infrastructure so that we can navigate any curriculum and facilitate learning anytime, anywhere. In this aspect, the pandemic has definitely fast forwarded the future of learning here and now. I'll be touching on these six design strategies. First, let's explore the planning principles in a learning environment. In any education facility, learning spaces have the highest percentage of utilization of students throughout the day. These include the learning communities, such as classrooms. Designing these spaces or renovating an existing one for resilience and adaptability are fundamental for functional education delivery. Furniture can be used to reconfigure the space, allowing for segregation of seating arrangements and also subdividing large spaces into smaller clusters by using screens, operable walls, movable panels, etc. The diagram on the left shows a typical classroom configuration. An operable wall system in between these two classrooms provide opportunities for opening up adjacent rooms to each other to create a larger room. A larger space automatically allows for safe distancing of its occupants without splitting the classroom up. This is of course on an assumption that only 50% of the school community attend school physically and another 50 is on home-based learning. Opportunities for opening adjacent classrooms to each other create a larger space to keep the class together in one room while keeping safe distancing. Future design considerations of the learning space include creating large and small collaborative spaces within the classroom, providing physical and visual connections into rooms for monitoring purposes, creating space for virtual connection with students who are not present in the classroom, and also incorporating operable windows to maximize fresh air. Circulation areas are typically very crowded at the beginning of a school day, during recess, and also in between classes. Design strategies of a school circulation paths should provide adequate separation to support multi-directional flow. Design opportunities here include providing a wider corridor to allow for two-way traffic, creating one and two-way circulation pathways, designating entrances and egress to enforce one-way traffic flow, utilizing directional signage on the floor, and even eliminating lockers from one or both sides of the corridor. Reducing the amount of movement for students and staff throughout the day can reduce human interaction. Having some breakout areas along the corridor may also help to provide waiting areas where there are large groups of students circulating through a change of class. In administrative offices, these are one of the busiest places in the school. A design approach would be to consider the entrance lobby as a checkpoint for both security and health. There should be proper space for queuing, for temperature scanning, and also for hand sanitization. Reducing the number of people waiting in the office requires a secure visitor waiting area directly accessible to the main office. This can be in the form of a vestibule used by visitors prior to gaining access into the main office. Only those visitors and students who are required direct interaction with an office staff should be allowed to enter the main office, while others should wait outside or in other areas. Dining halls over the years have been designed to hold large amount of students. In order to maximize efficiency and minimize the time needed to serve food, 
Modern surveys have been organized in a scattered format where students enter the area and then scatter to different food stations. This scatter approach may be improved to respond to physical distancing to create a more orderly one-way single line approach to reduce physical contact. For primary schools, dining may be best decentralized and separated into many smaller spaces. For secondary schools, the canteen may be enlarged into multi-purpose halls, which can double up as part of the dining area during break times. Segregation of meals can be scheduled to different levels and at different intervals to minimize physical interaction. Student commons are large open areas for students to congregate before or after school and even between classes. Designed with flexibility in mind, these spaces can be reconfigured easily for multi-purpose use during a pandemic. An area that's always neglected are restrooms. Used throughout the day, restrooms are one of the places where a high probability of cross-contamination can occur. Some design considerations include removing doors and providing privacy screens at the entrance and providing automatic doors for hands-free entry. Normally, a single entrance or exit plan will work, provided the path of the users do not cross each other and the main entrance is wide enough. The diagram on the right suggests creating restrooms that have separate entrance and separate exits to reduce personal contact. Aside from increased area requirements, challenges associated with reconfiguring plumbing systems may make this solution a little bit more challenging, but still doable with careful planning. Teachers who are at the forefront of students should not be neglected. Not only do they serve to deliver the education, teachers also need space to collaborate with one another. These spaces need to be appropriately supported by technological infrastructure. They need to have adequate space for focused conversations with peers, students, or even parents. They need to have a place to take a break, to rest, and also to do private work. A larger office can be easily reconfigured to create smaller groups and individual areas for privacy and safety. This example of a staff room, where a large area can be divided into separate zones using operable partitions. Each zone can house a cluster of teachers which have their own entry and exit points, supported, of course, by collaboration areas and soundproof individual pods. There is a more conscious effort now in choosing and using materials and finishes which are easily maintained and disinfected. We know that viruses is transferred not only between two people, but also between exposed surfaces, as elaborated by my colleague earlier. When we come into contact with high touch surfaces, the viruses can spread easily. High touch surfaces in a typical classroom include door handles, light switches, tables and chairs, and even glass windows. The evaluation of selecting finishes must go beyond the way it looks and feels. It is important that surfaces can be cleaned and disinfected effectively, leaving little room for human error. In a normal school environment, we know that there are many isolated and individual systems controlling the built environment. While a physical master plan is a process that provides an overall framework to guide the physical development and growth of the built environment over time, a digital master plan, which example on the right, is an integrative process that provides an overall framework to guide the development and growth of the digital solution and services. A digital twin can be found in many applications nowadays, for example, a taxi ride. Or, in our daily lifestyle and health management. In a smart campus, a digital master plan brings benefit and improvement to both its users and their processes. 
through innovative use of the digital twin of a built environment, connecting spaces, things, and people's interaction with one another will improve lives. By firstly identifying people's needs in their right setting, and then connecting it to the purpose, scale, sociability, and their supporting facilities and technologies. Combining smart processes with smart user experience, solutions can be assigned to problem statements and implemented in a variety of work, learn, and play settings. Integrating smart facilities such as sprinklers and lighting systems, ventilation, water, and also gas systems, vertical transportation and electrical systems, and combining all these to create a smart estate. Over time, the physical built environment that is enabled by technology will improve our work, how we live, and also how we play. The COVID-19 outbreak had highlighted one major challenge for many schools this year. Many students did not have the necessary devices for online learning. It was reported that the Ministry of Education had to bring forward its earlier plans to equip students, loaning out some 20,000 laptops and some 1,600 dongles for students for home-based learning. Touch-free collaboration and digital support are also needed to help learning, including the use of more digital whiteboards, smart screen sharing, virtual meetings, and other seamless platforms of communication. With the help of these new technologies, if we use them thoughtfully, all areas in schools can be optimized to offer cleanliness, better air quality, and better hygiene. These include temperature sensors, outdoor doors, smart elevator controls, smart contactless cards, face recognition, and also wave sensors. Ecosystems are important, especially in our densely populated cities. Have you noticed that more people are exercising during circuit breaker? And for those who have gone outdoors, have you noticed that more people are in parks and trails, either walking, running, or cycling? Similar to a healthy diet, we all need. Nature also offers a conducive environment for our health, which can boost our well being and productivity. More education institutions are embracing environmentally sensitive practices, and at the heart of sustainability is biophilic design. Open spaces are now realized for its purpose, aesthetics, and safety in mind and schools are now tracking how and when these open spaces will be efficiently used daily while keeping within new norms in social standards. There is also now a time management component to the open spaces given the constraints insofar as the size and capacity is allowed. In the implementation of landscape and wellness in an education environment, we need to understand the variety of spaces available in school to promote health and well being. Optimize the benefits that can be offered from nature and the ecosystem that is implemented, including the location, the type of system adopted, the choice of plants, budget, and also maintenance regime. In a pandemic situation, safety measures may lead to less certainty, certainty for food and exports. It is important for our society to be resilient in such a time. Food resilience can be tackled from both the macro scale by urban farmers and at the micro scale from citizens taking responsibilities for their own food consumption. What better way to inculcate such practices than in a school campus? Finally, we look at facilities management and some operational considerations. In an operational mode, we know that students are at the lowest risk when engaging in virtual learning. This, of course, is the best option. However, if a physical face-to-face -face learning is required, then educating and promoting safe habits such as safe distancing, hand hygiene, washing, and also disinfecting regularly 
are required. There are many other remote monitoring and decentralized deployments that can be considered, including using smart hubs with centralized management capabilities and remote monitoring supported by video analytics. Maintaining a clean and healthy environment is important. Daily upkeeping and ensuring a clean environment has to be kept at all times, including cleaning the building ventilation system, ensuring water systems are checked and safe during prolonged facility shutdown. In summary, with the residual impact of COVID-19 and the changing needs of our education environment, we continue to refine our approach and services to provide better solutions. Thank you for taking the time to hear our ideas. Back to you, Vanessa. Thanks, Patrick, for sharing the lessons learned from this pandemic and how the design strategies can be considered to enhance the experience for the students and staff in educational facilities while keeping all the users safer. For pandemic resilience design, the healthcare infrastructure is definitely an area that we can also learn from. Our last speaker, architect Saurabh Bagra, is Senior Principal Architect with the Healthcare Division under CPG Consultants. He was the lead architect for the National Center of, for Infectious Diseases and Center for Healthcare Innovation. He is currently leading the development of the new office headquarters for Ministry of Health Singapore. Saurabh will share applications from our playbook strategies on healthcare facilities and how these can be designed to be more medically prepared for future pandemics. On to you now, Saurabh. Thank you, Vanessa. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to share our perspective in healthcare with you all today. What a challenging year this has been. This pandemic has proven to be the biggest stress test for healthcare infrastructure around the globe, and none of us were prepared for this COVID-19. As this famous microbiologist, Louis Pasteur, once said, fortune favors the prepared mind. Our healthcare infrastructure also needs a vision that is far-sighted. So what constitutes the pandemic resilience in healthcare? The first thing that comes in mind is our healthcare infrastructure, our facilities, the hospitals, the healthcare workers, and so on. And next, how robust are the health policies and advisories that guide the action in times of crisis? And finally, it is us, the people, our behaviors and habit, and most importantly, our mindset. To build pandemic resilience, we need to plan for it. It's a long-term outcome that requires a long-term approach. This change cannot happen overnight. We need to adopt a mindset for change and only then we can adapt to the challenges that come in the future. We must also reconcile that we can never plan for everything. Planning should prioritize scenarios that are practical. To build resilience, we must look beyond what we do today, what future needs might be and what supporting infra we need to meet those new requirements. A good starting point is to apply lessons from recent experiences. Let's see why a change mindset is necessary to be ahead of the curve in healthcare. In early 2003, the WHO announced SARS as a global pandemic. Singapore, a busy transit hub and a regional destination saw over 200 cases locally. Lives were lost. Our healthcare facilities were not prepared to tackle this novel virus. As a swift response, the Ministry of Health commissioned CPG consultants to design and build isolation facilities at the CDC grounds. Fast forward 15 years, this decision proved to be a major step towards building pandemic preparedness in Singapore. Last year, as NCID officially started operations, Singapore was better prepared to take on future outbreaks. We were so blessed and fortunate that NCID was ready before COVID-19 stuck. As NCID is continuing to support this ongoing crisis, 
The clinicians and operators are learning and improving their processes every day. These lessons will trickle down to our next generation hospitals and healthcare facilities. And we hope we can adopt and apply these learnings in our future works. Now let's see how some of these design strategies discussed earlier can be applied to our projects. First, we start with the key planning principles that lay the foundational approach in design. To give some context, let's consider the brief from NCID. Located up opposite Tantoxing Hospital in Novena, the NCID CHI complex comprises of a 14-story, 586-bed infectious diseases hospital and a nine-story admin and staff training facility, the Center for Healthcare Innovation. The site is at the edge of the Novena Health City and surrounded by private residential condominiums. The perception of a sensitive facility in my backyard was managed through articulating privacy and safety in design. The CHI was therefore designed to act as a buffer between condominiums and the NCID. To soften the clinical nature of NCID and provide spaces for urban respite, series of landscape decks were designed for staff and visitors to the facility. And the development also facilitates connections to the health, uh, Novena Health City and public amenities through overhead and underground linkages. And these connections are crucial to hospital operations to connect to the wider community, especially in the integrated general and community hospitals where pandemic resiliency is so important. Next, we will see how NCID integrates flexibility in design for future scenarios. In this conceptual stacking of the facility, NCID and CHI share a three-story podium over four levels of basements. Due to the site topography, basement one is considered as the ground level and is used for secured service access and other hospital functions. Basement one also houses a 500 pack screening center that can be operationalized during outbreaks. NCID is designed in two wings, low and the high risk. The right wing of NCID is designated as the high risk wing, which largely houses the negative pressure wards, a high level isolation unit and a BSL-3 lab. And depending on severity of the outbreak, NCID can be isolated and locked down by one ward one floor, one wing, or the whole building. To ensure business continuity, CHI and public linkages are designed to be operational in the scenario of a whole building lockdown for NCID. The ward design is roughly triangular in shape for better line of sight to patient rooms and to improve operational efficiency. NCID is designed to ensure safe environment with separation of clean and dirty flows through separation of lifts and MNE. It is self-contained and can be locked down without compromising other operational functions. The wards are designed with a modular concept to enable future conversion of one type of ward into another with minimal renovations and without impact to major structures. The naturally ventilated wards can be converted to negative pressure air conditioned isolation rooms by adding a demountable partition. The room can therefore be split in two rooms and be supported by air conditioning. The patient rooms have been designed to be able to add beds in case of severe outbreaks. As such, the bed capacity can be increased from 330 beds to over 580 beds. Each patient room has an ensuite toilet kamsha and placed within two rooms with a nursing alcove at the entrance, it gives a good visibility of the patients from the staff corridor. This arrangement also allows to maximize the views and enhance daylight uh, for the patients. The ward module requires a 10.5 meter column grid to accommodate two such patient rooms. 
The facility also caters for a high level isolation ward that is capable of treating patients who are afflicted with highly virulent infectious diseases such as Ebola. The ward has a satellite laboratory and a decontamination room to ensure independent operations. The HLIU is a key design innovation in NCID as an outcome of a co-creation process with the operators, clinicians, planners, and consultants. The team conducted benchmarking visits at Emory and Atlanta in the US before finalizing the design. To maintain a high degree of separation and allow safe operations, the patient room is supported by extensive support spaces for staff and logistics. The rooms are designed with strict pressure control regime that is maintained by interlocking doors. The patient room itself is planned with ample free space for equipment, trolleys, incubators, etc. And to ensure patient privacy and minimize cleaning surfaces, switchable glass is used instead of privacy curtains. Now, another important consideration in planning adaptable facilities is the provision for future expansion. From a past experience, we observe that with advancements in clinical treatment and technology, hospitals will always need additional space for expansion and process improvement. These white spaces can be used for future use to expand capacity, or as in case of NCID, the provision of reserved wards, which are mothballed and kept warm for activation to meet additional demand during outbreaks. So how ready was Singapore for COVID-19? As you see in this short timeline, the response to the immediate crisis was very swift. Even before COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic, MOH and NCID activated pre-designed protocols for conversion of cohort wards into isolation rooms in order to expand the bed capacity. 32 isolation rooms were converted across four wards in a span of nine days. The naturally ventilated cohort rooms were converted into air-conditioned isolation rooms by installing polycarbonated panels at the windows to ensure air tightness. Similarly, demountable walls were installed to split four bedded cohorts into two isolation rooms. The team also ensured proper testing and commissioning of the rooms through air pressure regime and smoke pressure tests. It is also interesting to see our industry coming together for innovative solutions for existing facilities. This is one example from SGH where existing wards and OTs were retrofitted with a portable system that allows for conversion to a negative pressure room. In a sense, this unit helps to act like an anti-room and helps to manage air pressure regime to the dirty areas. The use of appropriate material in healthcare is also critical. Hospital acquired infections can be a major challenge for healthcare operators. As a colleague Orville shared earlier, we will need to use materials that are easy to clean and disinfect. In general, we use low VOC materials that have excellent antimicrobial properties. The surfaces need to be non-porous and highly resistant to common disinfectants such as bleach and hydrogen peroxide. Details for floor coving, wall protection, junction seals, etc., need to be carefully considered to enable easy cleaning. Similarly, use of fabrics should be limited to avoid dust and mold growth. For key areas like operation theaters that require frequent cleaning and disinfection, we can use glass panels as an alternative to traditional powder coated stainless steel systems. Glass is highly resistant and impervious to repeated hydrogen peroxide exposure. As my colleague Patrick had already shared broad system design strategies, I will briefly cover the m &E design from a planning perspective. Traditionally, we plan for AHUs adjacent to the space it caters to. Here we have an example of how m &E can be consolidated on separate floors to improve operational efficiency. This eliminates disturbance to the patient areas during maintenance 
and ME flows can be located closer to the key functional units like ICUs, OTs, etc., to service high MEP demand. This strategy also allows the flexibility to plan for system redundancy, where co-located AHUs can be shared for use during downtime and maintenance. One of the key design considerations for m and &E for pandemic-ready facilities is the airflow management within various spaces. The idea is to keep a unidirectional flow of air from clean areas to dirty areas. In times of outbreak, the patient areas are considered dirty and the staff needs to be protected by careful design of the airflow within the facility. Patient rooms can also be designed with negative pressure, single pass air conditioning. The exhaust air can be treated using HEPA filters and UV lights before discharge. We have observed how technology is also playing an increasingly important role in almost every aspect of our lives, especially in these challenging times. Technology integration and planning is ever so important to critical public health facilities. And there are wide uses and applications in healthcare from robotics to contact tracing and data management, etc. While most technology is moving towards wireless systems, there, there will still be a need for physical integration at the back end to meet new energy demands. IT backbone and IT infrastructure can be planned to allow for future expansion. Spare risers and cross facility trunkings can be planned from day one. Today, I will cover a handful of strategies that are directly relatable from the recent COVID-19 experiences. One of these strategies is a contactless design approach, which is widely being adopted in every development. Automated dispensing systems have always been in healthcare settings to avoid physical touch and maintain hygiene. And going forward, we will continue to see more automation in these systems. PPE dispensers, for example, can have inventory management systems to ensure adequate supplies at all times. Thermal imaging for screening and contact tracing have become a new norm already, and we will see higher integration of other smart systems that increase the security while maintaining user autonomy. Similarly, building operations will be automated with users able to control MEP remotely through their mobile apps, voice activated systems, and so on. And privacy glass can eliminate the need for physical blinds. Smart sensors and IoT integration will further help in enforcing safety distancing through occupancy sensing. Next, I will cover some examples that show how nature and wellness approach can be adopted in healthcare. We often see hospitals as clinical facilities, and unfortunately, the recent experiences have shown that hospitals need to be central to the communities they serve. Furthermore, we need healthcare facilities to blend in with the nature and surroundings to make them warm and welcoming for the users to celebrate and appreciate an environment of wellness. The recent COVID-19 experience has also shown us how important the outdoor green park spaces are. The greenery and open air have a soothing and calming effect on our psychological well-being. But we do recognize that not all sites enjoy natural green settings. NTFGH, an integrated general and community hospital, is designed in an urban context. But a conscious effort has been made to adopt vertical greening strategies to bring this amenity to the users. Set in a dense urban environment, NTFGH hosts complex healthcare functions in a highly connected commercial and transportation hub of Jurong East. Here you see a close-up of the typical ward module. The wards are designed in a fan-shaped profile that opens up to pockets of green landscape terraces. Every patient has its own window of green. These green terraces are integral part of the design that help to bring nature close to the patients. Integrating such spaces in hospitals has a positive impact on patient recovery and well-being. The staggered planning of ward also allows for direct use from nurse counters 
alleviating some work stress for the nursing staff. And the ward itself is much more open and conducive for natural ventilation, bringing thermal comfort to the patients and improving the air quality in the wards. The design also allows for separate maintenance access without disturbing the patients in the wards. Here we see how nature weaves in the facade envelope, creating a fabric of natural healing environment. Nature and wellness approach plays an important role in making our healthcare facilities more resilient. Integrating these strategies in the design promotes environments that nurture and heal us 24 seven. Lastly, I will cover briefly on the operational considerations that are important from a facilities management perspective. In a hospital, we need a robust standard operating procedure manual that is worked in collaboration with the facility operators and clinicians. SOP is an important document that ensures that the operator has a 360 overview of operations and protocols in various scenarios. This may vary from PPE training for staff to maintenance of critical m &E systems. Pest control, hygiene, and cleanliness also important considerations. Appropriate details to seal possible ingress points and sealing gaps in cavities ensures a good measure to address these issues. And preventing mold growth within healthcare facilities is very critical to prevent sick building syndrome. Regular checks and inspections for dampness and water leakage is the key to prevent mold and bacterial growth. With this, I finished my presentation and I hope the session was informative and useful to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Back to you, Vanessa. Thanks, Sarab, for the informative presentation and highlighting the different aspects of pandemic resilient scenario planning in healthcare facilities. Now, we shall be starting the panel discussion in a moment. This session will be moderated by our Group Chief Innovation Officer, Architect Tan Xiaoyan. As GCIO, Xiaoyan leads TPG Corporation in its group of companies in fostering innovative and collaborative endeavors, bringing about valuable experience in delivering international projects across a diverse range of typologies in both public and private sectors. A firm advocate of biophilic designs, Xiaoyan actively participates and shares his insights at platforms such as the International Network for Tropical Architecture Conference, Singapore Institute of Architects Practice Conventions, Board of Architects Seminars, and many other industry events. Thank you for submitting your questions pre-webinar and during the webinar. We will try to cover as many questions as we can in the panel session. Xiaoyan, please. Hi. Once again, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank all the speakers for the presentations. Can I invite the speakers back? Um, let's take some moment to let them come back to join us. Okay. So while we wait for them, as a summary, in today's webinar, our GCO, Kyu Seng Kun, uh, shared about the background of how our teams had distilled learning lessons from our healthcare expertise into the set of principles and strategies that is easier for us as uh, bio environment professionals to apply. So these were packaged into the pandemic, uh, CPG Pandemic Resilience Playbook, which was introduced by architect Jerry Ong. So it comprises of uh, six strategies, planning principles, materiality, systems design, technology, nature and wellness approaches, and smart estates. Uh, out of the six strategies, our second speaker, Orville, shared about materiality, and then followed by the third speaker, Patrick Lam, uh, engineer Patrick Lam, who had shared about systems design. And uh, after that, um, architect Patrick Tan shared about how the strategies were applied in the educational typology and last but not least, architect Saurabh had shared about the insights and experience gained from NCID and uh, pandemic resilient design in the healthcare context. Now, let me see, the, are the panel members, uh, panelists are back? Uh, I think they're all here. Okay, great. Now, let me, let me start 
by warming you up, uh, um, let me start by asking the panelists this fundamental question. Is Singapore's built environment industry pandemic resilient? And where do you think we are at? You know, are we are we there? So, so in the context of today's webinar, we, we could perhaps focus on the healthcare and education context. Um, of course, if any of you feel free to expand beyond that, you, you, you are welcome. So, so let's start with the healthcare um, sector. Um, and we have three experts, uh, I think architect Jerry um, Orville, as well as uh, engineer Patrick Lam, uh, are very experienced in healthcare. Uh, maybe I start by asking Jerry to share your thought about how ready is Singapore's uh, bio environment industry in terms of pandemic resilience in the healthcare context. Jerry, please. Right. Thank you, Xiaoyan. Well, okay. Uh, I think Singapore is really known, okay, well known as one of the most well planned cities in the world. You know, I mean, just to quote Edward Glaser, he's an urban economist. You know, he said Singapore is close to the ideal model of land use planning in the 21st century. So as Singaporeans, we all understand every inch of land in Singapore is planned, you know, where we, where we look at our industries, our schools, financial centers, our hospitals, right? I mean, but we can only plan for what we can foresee. So I remember when SARS hit in 2003, you know, Singapore, like many other countries, were really, who are affected, were really struggled to deal with it. But we learned from the experience and we put in place measures and infrastructure so that we'll be better equipped to deal with the next pandemic. And I think you can hear from Sora, I think NCID was one such facility that was conceptualized post-SARS. And it was completed just last year, just in time for COVID-19. I mean, in fact, NCID had to handle suspected cases of monkey pox, you know, before the facility was even officially open. So, but I will say that it's not a matter of luck, but this is really about us having learned from our past experiences and we, that we are prepared for the next event. So this is why, you know, the main reason why we put together this whole idea of this whole playbook, you know, really is to formulate a framework, list out these strategies so that we can improve our built environment to be better equipped for the next pandemic. It's a work in progress, right? And I'm very happy that we have taken the first step. So, so summing up from what you said, um, my understanding is that we are somewhat prepared. We can never be 100% prepared, uh, but we should always... Um, learn learn uh, on the job and uh, take whatever we learn and move forward is that is that uh, the gist of what that's, that's right because yeah. um can i say that every pandemic will be different you know how mm. what sars how, what happened during sars what happened during covid 19 they're very different and we must be actually responsive you know to be able to make sure that our facilities can adapt and be flexible enough to do whatever that's thrown to us right very so, nimble, stay, very, stay very nimble Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sarab, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Or, or Patrick, uh, Patrick, um, Patrick Lam, do you have anything to add? Mm. Sarab, please. Okay. Uh, I mean, yes, Jerry is like uh, very correct that we learn new things after this pandemic. And NCID was designed in pre uh, COVID world, right? And going forward, we're also like very excited to hear back from uh, the clinicians and operators uh, at NCID and CHI they experience because uh, they're going through this as we speak. And after, they, uh, after the whole experience of COVID, I think that feedback will be very, very critical. We're already like looking forward to engaging them into some sort of uh, post-occupancy studies uh, so as mm. to gather that feedback and apply mm. that in our next uh, designs and uh, adopt those uh, changes and improvements as they come. Yeah, I, I agree with you, you know, as someone who is uh, advocating the need for collaboration and integration, um, this, this partnership between built environment professionals, because we bring what we know to the table, um, we contribute that to, to say other disciplines like uh, in this case healthcare, and then we combine our knowledge with their knowledge and, 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 and we co-create solutions, right? Um, um, Patrick Lam, you have anything to add with regard to this um, pandemic re uh, re yeah. readiness that, that uh, you know? How ready are we? Yeah, I think I agree with what Sarab said. Uh, from this, uh, from the feedback uh, from the operation of the hospital in the past few months, we also learned a lot of uh, how they get ready, how they use the facilities. Now, in terms of building services, uh, the epidemic resilience 
proposals, uh, the requirements are, some of the requirements are not new and some are actually, we learn from the NCID experience also. So uh, in other words, it is a good learning path. We have actually gone through the NCID and there are also new things we found from this COVID-19. Thanks, uh, thanks, Patrick. So, so um, um, Architect Patrick Tan. So, turning back to you on the regarding to uh, this, 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 uh, educate regarding the education sector. So, obviously, we have been designing for making ensuring that healthcare um, buildings are safe huh, for longest time, right? So, we have been building our knowledge. Um, the the question now is that in the education sector, um. How do you see the scenario? Because because education sector is, is suddenly exposed to this this pandemic, right? And and do you think that um, are we pandemic resilient? Are we there? You know how how ready are we? Can, can you share your thoughts, Patrick? Sure. Um, well, I think despite the tough time that we went through over the the past five five uh, you know to to nine months, I actually think that uh, Singapore has adapted well. Um, we, we don't know when the next pandemic will, will come or know what it might be, but I actually see some success, some light at the end of the tunnel. From my observation, from my three uh, school-going children, um, I see the shift, the virtual shift as, as a success for the future of learning. Many schools actually took a proactive approach you know, to do remote learning in such a short time, uh, establishing new routines and programs you know, early on, uh, scheduling time for small group discussions uh, and also uh, allowing for longer chunks of time for, for deeper work, helping students form study groups and prioritizing uh, individual learning. I think moving forward, uh, there are three key areas that uh, we, we should look at. Uh, one uh, definitely is uh, designed for adaptability. Uh, we need to be flexible. We need to design for spaces that can be easily uh, reconfigurable, you know, that can expand and contract and change uh, to fit the latest uh, ped pedagogy and also to support active and more engaging modes of learning. Secondly, uh, we need to embrace technology. I mean, we see um, you know, the benefit of online learning, virtual learning anywhere, anytime. Uh, and and we, we, we recognize that, we experience that, you know, uh, at, at work as well. Uh, and thirdly is uh, inculcating uh, wellness. I think the pandemic has really enhanced the importance of nature and wellness. Uh, you know, we are all cooked up at home. And I think we, uh, we know the value of, of health and, and wellness, as Jerry said, you know, not only physical health, and, but it's also a mental health. I think that's, that's important. Uh, to reduce stress, uh, improve our cognitive function, and also to enhance one's mood. Okay, thanks, Patrick. I, I can't agree with you more because uh, I, I've shared personally in other forums that um, uh, it's a good thing uh, that Singapore has been pushing for the digital infrastructure, as well as a lot of, of our social and uh, and uh, green infrastructure. You know, if these things are not in place, I I don't think we can we are able to survive uh, or or at least uh, maintain our sanity through through the uh, the, the 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 hunkering down period uh, the the circuit breaker period. Okay, now we let's let's turn our attention attention to the pandemic resilience playbook. Uh. So we 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 learned that there are six strategies and we have heard two of them, right? Um, let us focus on the, these two: uh, materiality and systems. So so let's turn the questions to Orville and uh, Patrick Lam, engineer Patrick Lam. So why, why are materiality and systems design important to pandemic resilience? And, and in, in your view, how does it, uh, how, how, how are these two, um, how do they fit in with the other strategies? So um, can, uh, maybe can Ovil start first? Ovil, please. Yeah, thank you, Xiaoyan. Uh, good question. Okay, for materiality, when we, as an architect and designer, we really look at it in terms of their uh, aesthetic value. So sometimes we take it for granted that uh, how it will affect um, the transmission of the viruses or bacteria. So now we have, um, I can say we have more control and we have more knowledge on um, 
how we can uh, prevent uh, all of this virus from spreading. And it's also necessary, for example, in an in existing environment uh, where I have a given example on the carpet. So for carpets, it is uh, now uh, a matter of uh, discussing with the FM, it's discussing with the, with the user on how they can uh, clean and disinfect that, uh, that facility for this, uh, this uh, material okay, in order for uh, that uh, function or that space that will not uh, spread the virus. Okay, that's it for me. Back to you, Xiaoyan. Okay, um, I'm, I'm looking at the, one of the participants question. Uh -huh. um, so they did ask about, uh, I think this one was sent to us earlier. Uh, they did ask about uh, whether CBG have developed tender specification mm. for materials uh, specific for pandemic resilience. Um, do, do you want to answer this question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Xiaoyan. That's a good question. Okay. Um, uh, for CPG, we haven't really developed uh, a tender specs specific for pandemic res resilience because it only happened uh, just uh, recently, right? But what we can do or what we are doing right now is we are leveraging on our uh, healthcare uh, experience, okay, that uh, we have actually applied or we have used um, all of these uh, principles, like, for example, uh, antimicrobial properties for uh, ceiling greens. And also we have used um, for the handrails or the grab rails, uh, uh, plastics. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that we can actually leverage on and we can share with our colleagues as well uh, uh, in CPG so that they can apply it to their um, current projects that are running right now. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, thanks, uh, Ovil. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let, let's turn to Patrick Lam. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of systems design, um, what, what do you think? How, what, what are they important? In pandemic resilience? Oh, oh, for system, I think the for air conditioning system, they are especially important because the occupants in the building, they're actually breathing the air from the air handling unit, from the air con system. Now, uh, for the for the hospital design, of course, we talk about directional flow, uh, pressure regime. Uh, extensive use of HIPAA filters, etc. Now, for this knowledge, this background, we can also leverage and use it for normal buildings. Of course, we are not putting in all these systems, but based on the same principle, we can also look at it from the airflow, from the mm. use of filter, and reasonably apply them to normal building. Mm. For pandemic resilience. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so so since we are on this topic, uh, I'm trying to uh, relate that to some of the questions that the participants are raising. So I think one of the concern is that with pandemic, the need for pandemic resilience, uh, maintenance costs and operation costs comes in, right? So one of the participants is asking this question: All new pandemic design strategies require expensive finishes and systems. Um, okay, so do you agree with that? Number one. Nah? Number two, what can be done in developing countries where cost is a major issue? I, I think even in Singapore, cost is also an issue. <laughs> okay, so, so let's, let's address cost in general. I think we have to find ways to ensure safety uh, and health, huh? but the cost has to be under control. So um, can... Can one of you, maybe Patrick, Patrick Lam, can you address okay. this question? Mm. Now, uh, regarding cause, uh, now for, for the epidemic uh, resilience playbook, we have actually a number of, uh, just now I presented also a number of uh, strategies uh, for this purpose, but actually a number of them are already being practiced. For example, uh, air flushing and all these, is also part of the code we are practicing air flushing. Uh, for air handling unit, definitely if we need air con, there's also air, air handling units are involved. But if we need more fresh air, maybe we need a bigger unit. A bigger unit. Uh, so with the detergent, uh, with this playbook, it would be very useful. When we do the design, 
we can actually apply the principles and uh, also in our interaction with the client and all these, we can make informed decisions. Uh, informed okay. decisions. And then we are aware of the cost, but the decisions will be if we need to increase, what are the advantages, what are the pros and cons? And for this period, uh, for this playbook, there are a number of cons there, a number of approaches. So we can actually use it in our decision and discussion with them. Okay, th thanks uh, Patrick. I, I, I want to come back to you because there's another question for, from uh, raised by the participants uh, about energy side. So, so, mm. so KPEX, uh, the, the capital yeah. cost is one thing. Uh, later mm. on, there's another thing about energy cost, operation cost. Uh, mm. But I, I want to pause for a while and then maybe ask one of the uh, other panelists uh, to address this cost question. Um, would Jerry want to address this? Because while in terms of safety and all that, we could, we may have to increase cost in one aspect, but I think there are trade off uh, that we can leverage. For example, sometimes some some costs in the society uh, due to the change of uh, change of uh, this lifestyle, right? There may be cost saving somewhere else. You know, um, I, I know it's a very very vague framework, uh, but uh, maybe you can share your thoughts. Yeah, I think it's a tricky it's a tricky one because I'm sure a lot of everybody, right, whether they're designers or even clients, uh, will be asking that question, you know, how much does it cost? How much more does it cost? And I think similar to what Patrick has articulated, uh, some of these are already quite embedded, you know, in some of our projects you know, and specifications. It's, it's also that I think with COVID-19, it just brings to the fore a lot more awareness. And I think this is actually has a rippling effect in the market as well. A lot of suppliers, are also starting to look at some of these, you know, antibacterial, antimicrobial type of properties in their projects. And I believe in the near future, this will become the norm. Okay. And when it becomes a norm, I believe that the price will come down. So I'm optimistic to, to think that in the long term, you're not really talking about having a lot, needing to invest a lot more money to have this type of, you know, functions in your specifications of materials. So, that, that's, that's my take on this particular topic. I think that's my hope also, because as designer, we know uh, sometimes mm. once you become aware of some yeah. uh, requirements, right? You design out from, you get it right from, 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 from the start. Uh, right. uh, the, the cost is not exponential, uh, right? It's, it's at, at most some, some incremental cost. That, that's our, our, always our aim, uh, right? Our, our aim and our, our belief system. Okay, so I, I want to come back to Patrick about energy. Uh. This, this one maybe not so easy, not so difficult, mm -hmm. not so easy. Uh, no. A question to answer is that: uh, Do you have any sense how much more energy will be used uh, due to the need for pandemic resilience? Um, maybe can you like provide an estimated yeah. range? Uh -huh. well, I think Thanks. the main the main additional energy use is in the additional amount of air, external air that go into the aircon system especially in the humid climate in Singapore. Now, the additional energy actually depends on a number of circumstances. Uh, but I think in terms of the air conditioning and additional energy use, it may be 10, 20%. But bearing in mind that this additional energy is only during the pandemic period, mm. When there's no epidemic during normal times, the system can be adjusted back to normal air conditioning, the normal amount of fresh air. Okay. So, so, so can you, are you able to like give a sense, you know, is, is, is it going to be 5% more, 10% more? Are you able to like provide uh, estimate? Yeah, in terms of energy, maybe about 20%. Because the air, con air conditioning system uh, basically deal with the heat and deal with the external air. And uh, okay. humidity is one of the major energy yeah, consumption. Okay. So, so if, if, if there's time, time per bit, uh, we may want to come back and revisit this question. Because uh, in terms of environmental sustainability, while there's a need for health and safety to, be, uh, to demand higher energy in, in say, maybe a hospital, right? 
but mm -hmm. as a as a as a city you know in, in terms of environmental environmental sustainability there could be ways to save energy somewhere else uh, but if we have time we come back to this question let me address some other questions uh, that uh, people have raised uh, there are quite a couple of questions on healthcare design uh, one is from dylan brady uh, with regards to um this question on infection control and he he asked this question uh, i think he, he worked with us before uh in terms of um he's talking about in the australia context healthcare design is designed around trauma and disease not infection control um so he asked a question how do we maintain a social control and separation in population that are infectious potentially infectious and not yet requiring hospitalization i i let uh, jerry and sarap digest this question do you want me to repeat the question okay how do we maintain a social control and separation in populations that are infectious potentially infectious and not yet requiring hospitalization i think this one goes really goes beyond bio environment design in a way but i think let, let's ponder this question because i think it's also kind of related uh, so so i let you ponder this question i come back to you um then there's another question um let me see okay there's one question on cbg design ncid with lots of considerations as a reflection how effective or successful are these design strategies Maybe this one I, I asked Saurabh to answer first. This one should be quite easy for you to address. Saurabh, do you want me to repeat this question? Uh, no, Shaoyan, I got mm -hmm. it. Uh, yep. I, I think uh, partly we addressed uh, this question previously, uh, as we said, that not all pandemics, uh, you know, uh, uh, th this won't be the last pandemic. And with every pandemic, we learn a new lesson. So while the feedback has been really good at the moment, and uh, we do recognize that there will be improvements coming forward. And I think the biggest takeaway for us uh, at the moment will be that, you know, during the COVID-19, this healthcare system was really overstretched. And there needs to be some sort of flexibility to relieve that pressure for the healthcare workers. And in, in that scenario, we feel that as pandemic uh, scenario planning really has to be embedded in design and operations. So you, you see how in NCID we carefully like uh, plan through those, thought through those scenarios that balanced health safety and business continuity. So I think this is something what probably the uh, is really required to ensure that the health system that forms the backbone, uh, including primary care, the acute care, the step down facilities, be able to manage that. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if that can be uh, integrated right from the design, that will really help in a way. So these okay. are some strategies which directly apply and help to strengthen the overall system in a way. Okay, I have another question for you. Uh, Jerry, I haven't, haven't forgotten about you. Huh? I'll come back to you. Uh, okay, <laughs> but the, for, for Saurabh, huh? there's another question. So let's say even NCID is safe, right? The occupants inside, you have designed it such that it's safe. Um, we know, right? Because th th there's an epicenter of fighting the, the, the COVID-19. And we know that somehow the staff morale has been kept high and uh, people are able to, to, to function. They, they have been uh, functioning very well and helping Singapore fight this, this disease. But what about the air being discharged? You know? So there's this question, any thought on planning design guideline for outdoor discharge air control that may affect nearby public spaces? So I'm, I'm thinking about NCID, that's the ultimate, right? So the air that's discharged, you know, do we worry about how that air may affect the nearby public spaces? Okay, so can you, uh, Saro, can you address this question? Sure, uh, I, I think it's a very good uh, uh, question and a very valid concern as well, because in times like these, you don't, you want to project that your facility is safe for operation and you can't forget what your neighborhood developments because it's, is, is a direct impact in a way. So I'll just take a use case of NCID, for example, uh, as Patrick already covered that, that all the patient rooms previously, they were using HIPAA filters, uh, UV light, and we also installed some high plume fans 
uh, on the rooftops to discharge the exhaust air uh, high up in the air. So it disperses, right? And I think uh, it's also good to run some simulations early in the design to test that out, right? And uh, we, we ran such simulations uh, while designing NCID. And it, I mean, to just break down the real number, it came down to 99.99995% uh, that it's safer. Mm -hmm. And you need to give that confidence back to people that yes, the facility is safe. And I, I think these are some of the strategies which probably are really, really useful. Uh, yeah. So in short, uh, through good design, it can be, can be it can be ensured. Uh, but of course, I think when we uh, look at how do we how do we uh, examine existing building, right? And and um, then 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 the existing building, the design, whether it's, it's adequate or not, that that needs to be audited or need to be examined uh, separately, right? That that's uh, I think uh, if we have time, we can ask Patrick Lam to to expand on that. I just want to quickly address some of the. Request. Uh, there are some requests to ask whether the table will be made available. Um, I think we are making that available. Uh, I think towards the end, uh, Jerry will share about how I think there's a QR code uh, for you to be downloaded. So, but I'm afraid you have to stay on until the end. Uh, Jerry will share more, more details. <laughs> uh, let me try to address some other questions. Um, okay, I, I, I want to try to go towards uh, Patrick Tan, uh, so otherwise he's, uh, he's sitting there and he's getting bored. Uh. Okay, so I, I want to come back to this question. Earlier, I, I, I did mention, uh, I think this is a personal concern also, is that pandemic resilience design uh, does require more energy usage and all that. Uh, and, and how does it affect environmental sustainability? And green marks, you know, in, in this case, there's one specific question asking about green mark scoring. Because, yeah, green mark asks for energy saving, right? If energy use uh, due to pandemic resilience it has gone up, how 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 do you see this conflict? You know, so um, uh, Patrick, are you able to take this question? Or do you want time? Do you need time to think through this question? Uh, yeah, I think I need a little bit time. <laughs> okay, to be area of expertise, green mark, but yeah, definitely we'll. we'll okay, I let you digest that. I let you digest that. Um, um, I, we come back to Jerry. Okay, let me digest that now. Nah. So Jerry, are you ready for that question? <laughs> now? Let me let me repeat the question. How yeah. do we maintain a social control and separation in populations that are infectious or potentially infectious and yet not yet requiring hospitalization? Mm. I think um, that this part on social separation, I think uh, Dylan's question has two parts to it. Uh. One is on this question about social dis control and separation. This other question is really about how quick, you know, some of these um, facilities, you know, can be adapted, you know, when such an event happens because of, you know, inherently how they are designed differently in the Australian context. I, I believe all healthcare facilities should be designed with the primary principle of adaptability and flexibility in place because we all understand that you know technology changes very fast, and even in this case, you know the type of pathogens they were dealing also will change from time to time. And I think therein lies the very important point about us designing it with the flexibility at the start. So, for example, I think uh, Sorok mentioned in his presentation, you know, he cited some examples about some existing facilities in SGH. They were able to use you know something that you can actually a facility you can add on so they become negative pressure. So this is one response. You know, to say that, look, maybe right at the start, that facility wasn't designed with the capability. And through this sort of add-ons, can I say it's an add-on, you deal with that issue. You know, in this, in other cases whereby, you know, I, I can cite some hospitals in Singapore, but NCID being one of the examples, you know, we have designed right from the start so that you can actually switch the mode, you know, from, you know, maybe without pressurization to negative pressure, for example, when the need arises. Yes, there will be some capital investment right at the start. But I think it's much better to have to be prepared, right? And you know, when it does happen, you'll be very glad that you actually have all these things in place. So that, that addresses one part of the question. The other question, which I find frankly, I'm not sure whether it's a question for an architect to answer. <laughs> you know, we're talking about social control, you know, separation in population. I think from you know, 
it's different, you know, in different countries. You know, the mindset, you know, how obedient we are, you know, and how socially conscious we are, you know, to even, you know, adhering to some very basic fundamental precautions like wearing a mask, you know, maintaining safe distancing and things like that. You know, so it is, it's, it's, just, it's tricky, it's tricky, you know, and I think we all have to go back to talk about how we actually educate and how we disseminate information to the public so that actually we are a bit more aware and conscious, you know, mm. and be updated whatever information that comes so that we can actually then understand the need for certain measures to be in place. You know, how we separate it, you know, people, people you know, different situation, different facility, I think it's a, we have to address it on a more case-by-case -case basis before, mm. you know, to, instead of trying to sound too simplistic about it. Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Jerry, for your comment. I think back to Dylan, who, I mean, thank you very much for asking this question. So I think there are two parts to this. You know, my, my take on, on this question uh, is that in the playbook, you see that there's this thing called the hierarchy of control, right? So when you come down to the personal protection level, there is the, the last line of defense. Yep. Okay, so, but applying this is not so easy. Like a society like Singapore, and, and when our healthcare authority and our government says, wear masks, you know, 95%, 98% people do it, you know. In another country, another culture, they may not, you know. We are, we are not critiquing here, uh, going to critique whether that's the right thing or wrong thing, but the same set of signs, how do you, how does one society look at it and, and, and adopt it? Uh, it is very different, you know. So, so really, I think uh, Jerry is right. Uh, it's not entirely something that can be answered by uh, pure environment professionals. Uh, and not entirely able to be answered by healthcare professionals, you know, and, and there's a larger complexity involved. Nah, okay, but I think I think for to Dylan, we can always uh, engage you uh, offline separately. Um, we come back to um, Patrick Tan. Patrick, are you yeah. are you ready to address that question? Okay, you know, let, let uh, this conflict me. between environmental sustainability sure. and and sure. you know the let need for safety you. and health. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And if uh, any of the other panel members... Uh, feel free, yes. Feel yes. free to jump in. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think uh, for the scoring system uh, for Green Mark, it is actually based on the normal operation. So on, on that pretext, it, it may not uh, affect the Green Mark uh, scoring at all. Um, in the event of an, a pandemic, a uh, system will normally switch uh, from a higher air change uh, per hour, so it will not penalise the, the Green Mark scoring. So the, the green mark is based, I mean, the simple answer is the green mark is based on a normal operation. Uh, so it will not, uh, uh, any any uh, event of pandemic will not affect the green mark scoring. Yep. So Maybe you, can I just add here, I mean, mm. for even for NCID, we managed to achieve green mark platinum. You know, for okay. a building, which is essentially, a whole building is a high, high isolation high room. It's a high energy, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. it's, it's designed for high energy usage, but so, you can yes. still... So if we can do it, you know, I don't think there's any other excuse. Can I say that? Yeah. Okay, can, can, can we, hmm, can, we can we can we look at it uh, beside the scoring partner uh, to, to Patrick and Jerry and of course others can feel free hmm. to come in. I think the score, we put it one side because that's a man-made mechanism. We can always re-examine the score. But fundamentally, there's this conflict between environmental sustainability and the, the need for health and resilience, uh, right? If we need to spend uh, more energy for health and resilience, do you see it as a conflict, or do you think that actually there's a way, there's a way to harmonize the two? Uh, you 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 see whether you can address this question because this one will link to a larger question um, raised by one of the participants. Uh, I think her name is Kate. Uh, yeah. So it's like, and and. And I want to maybe use that to round up the whole discussion. But uh, so you 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 think through this question, okay? Well, I ask Kate's question, right? And then let let all the participants hear the question. So Kate, ask this question: Where is the best health design strategy and thinking coming from? What new ideas are exciting the panel in health, telehealth, well-being, and patient-centric care? How do we use this crisis to reshape for the better? Maybe we focus on the last sentence, which is very often my own 
advocation. Huh? How do we use the pandemic? I, I use usually use the word as a catalyst, huh? as a catalyst for change, okay, for positive change. Since change is forced upon us, we have to change to respond to it. How can we use it as a catalyst to achieve better outcome? Okay, to reshape for the better. This is what Kate said. Uh, we can think of how can we use it to catalyze change in all aspects, environmental, social, right? I think there's an earlier question posed to us through email. Uh, it's about how can we be inclusive and in, 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 in ensuring this uh, pandemic resilience, uh, how can we extend that to all aspects of society, okay? I will want to address this question to all the panelists so each of you think through, um, whoever read the answer, go first, and then we will, we will round up the, the, the today's uh, webinar after all four of you have, have uh, addressed this question. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll start to address this first. Mm. Uh, Jerry, please. Yeah, I, I think I, I said earlier, I think we, we must all learn, you know, from our experience and not forget some of these lessons that we learn with each crisis that comes along. You know, with SARS, we learned. You know, and we have moved on, you know, we make sure we have the necessary infrastructure built in our healthcare to deal with this. And with COVID-19, again, it's something very different from SARS. We will also learn. And I mean, can I say that actually we are still in the midst of it, right? And we're still learning, right? And what we may learn tomorrow, one month later, could totally reshape how we look at this. Okay, and I think, I will, can I say that we will not really fully understand this in its entirety until this whole thing is over. And again, really, you know, the question is, we are not even sure, right, when the next pandemic will be like, mm. right? You know, I remember PM Lee talked about, you know, disease X, right? So yep. it's like, are we ready, you know, for next pandemic, you know, and how would this be different? You know, but again, I think we want to be optimistic about this. You know, I want to believe that we will all learn, okay, from this, and then we'll make sure that, you know, we put in all the necessary infrastructure, you know, even changing the right mindset, you know, so that when it does come, we'll be better equipped to deal with it. Just as an example, you know, I think with COVID-19, which is totally different from SARS, it is so unprecedented that everybody has to be forced to work from home, right? And we are now so used to doing it. So I can imagine, you know, in the near future, when we go back to work and when the next pandemic does happen and we need to switch from work from office to back to home, we'll be so, we find it so much easier to do that shift. You know, again, I think humans are not static. You know, we will always learn and we'll definitely be better prepared for the next one. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else wants to, do you, anyone of you have a different view or, or anyone wants to reinforce uh, Jerry's view? I, I just want to add, Xiao Yan. I think uh, for, for me, it is looking at it on a holistic uh, matter. I think with regards to, um, technological applications. I think, um, you know, working from home, you know, studying online, I think we are now uh, seeing a, a kind of like a digital takeover in, in a way of how we work and play, you know, mm. and also learn. Mm. I think it's very important with that we have to embrace uh, 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 technology. And the idea of uh, dig the digital master plan is something that we can uh, look forward to, you know, uh, in implementing not only in, in an education project, but, you know, also in healthcare, in, in other work offices, and, and even for commercial uh, and also residential. I think it will uh, dramatically uh, keep everyone, um, you know, uh, in touch with each other uh, using smart uh, user experience, smart facilities, and uh, in the long run, it will, it will, it will improve uh, the way that uh, we, we work and, and live. What about Patrick Lam? Yeah. Uh, from the building services point of view, I think the main one is we have to support all these changes. Uh, so the design of building services, we have to consider uh, as in the playbook, a number of changes, additional things and uh, maybe some some part uh, that we would actually improve and modify from the existing installation to provide for 
flexibility, etc., for the future. Okay, because thanks. We don't know what type of mm. circumstances okay. may. Be. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Ovil, yeah. you were the last one, um, please round up. Yeah. After we like round up the session. It's a good question. So, I'd like to focus on the exciting part. What makes me excited <laughs> now? <laughs> so, actually, it's mostly like the overall well being because I, I'm really envisioning our built environment will, will have a really mix of um, uh, landscaping, more into the, the plants. Because, as you see now, there's a lot of people who are involved or who are really. Um, into planting now because they're making their house very conducive in terms of like uh, with landscaping with the with the better furniture so that's the new norm that uh, I'm looking at so in terms of like built environment we need people right so I'm looking at I agree with the with Patrick as well uh, Patrick Tan that we have to look at it in terms of like holistic Okay, so a person really needs to be healthy in order for them to function properly. So for us, it really uh, gives us a big responsibility as an architect and designer to make it happen, right? For, for people to be uh, healthy and work well. Okay, I think that's, that's for me, what makes me excited. Mm, thank you, thank you. So with that, I thank you for, for all the panelists. Uh, thank you for your uh, contribution and your ideas, sharing your ideas. Um, um, and we thank for all the participants uh, who have been joining with us until this time, uh, until this stage. Huh? So, um, Jerry, I hand, it, hand back to you. I, I believe you have some announcement about the, uh, the play playbook. Thank you. Hi. Okay, so um, thank you, speakers, and everybody, everyone who joined us today. So, I mean, before we end the webinar, I would like to emphasize that actually the CPG Pandemic Resilience Playbook is a live working document. So while the framework was developed as a response to COVID-19 pandemic, it is still playing out as we speak, and we're all still learning to cope with it. So we hope that the playbook will help anyone who's interested in incorporating pandemic resilient features in his or her project. And we really see this as a starting point. And we endeavor to update the playbook as a need arises in future. So it will be launched in December. So watch out for it. So please scan the QR code to assess CPG's pandemic resilience solutions for the built environment website. So in, that, in addition, today's webinar will also be available on our YouTube channel. So when you exit the webinar later, you will also see a post-event survey. We hope you can take some time to give us your feedback. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. We hope to see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you.